Do you know fact from fiction when it comes to bond investing? Well, guess what? You're about to learn. Hi, I'm David Scranton. In the world of investing, Wall Street gets virtually all the attention. And as a result, you might just know quite a bit about stocks in the stock market, but perhaps a lot less about bonds and the bond market. Unfortunately, what you think you might know about the bond market could very well be more fiction than fact. We're going to correct that situation today as we reveal four shocking truths about bonds. They may surprise you simply because they're the exact opposite of what you've been told. You'll learn why bonds aren't bond funds. The two of them are different. Also, why bond bubbles aren't as scary as the media portrays. Why bond values aren't determined just by interest rates. And bond investors, why they're not necessarily sacrificing growth. And helping me out, as usual, is income specialist and best-selling author Jeff Small. But we're also going to be hearing from our special guest, author Harry Dent, as well as income specialist Mike Stewart, just outside of Chicago, Illinois, and Eric Lardner in Texas. But first, let's cover the single most important thing you need to know about bonds. And to be honest, this first fact won't shock anyone who watched a show before or read any of my books. Why? Because I repeat it often. Investing in bonds and investing in bond funds are two very different things. An advisor who specializes in growth-based strategies might not tell you there's a big difference. Why? Because based on their knowledge and their experience, they might only be able to offer you one option, or really they only know one option, and that's bond funds. They may tell you it's a conservative option, but it really just represents the conservative end of their aggressive business model. So here is the most important difference that you need to understand. When you buy an individual bond, whether it's U.S. Treasury, municipal, or corporate bond, you're entering into a contract. And with that contract, you typically get two important guarantees. A guaranteed dollar amount of interest that's paid for the life of the bond, and a repayment of the face value when the bond matures, provided there's no default. Now, by contrast, a bond mutual fund not only lacks those two important guarantees, but it also contains many of the risks of a stock mutual fund. In fact, the textbook definition of a bond fund is this, the stock of a company that owns bonds. It even sounds riskier, because ultimately bond funds take an investment tool that normally does have a contract and package it in such a way that eliminates the contract. And yes, while bond funds do technically qualify, as an income-based investment tool, they're not really an income-based strategy. And if that's what you're looking for, then what you really want is an actively managed portfolio of individual bonds and bond-like instruments, and preferably managed by a financial advisor who specializes in those things. So now let's take a moment to answer the first of your questions. Ken from Mississippi asks, what's the least risky type of bond that I can invest in? Ken, uh, the least risky type of bond, uh, at least in theory, is a U.S. Treasury bond uh, because you don't have any currency fluctuations and it's backed by the federal government's ability to print money. The problem, of course, is that right now, uh, a 10-year U.S. government bond is going to pay you approximately one and a quarter percent. So whether, although it's safe, you're not going to get a lot of return there. And again, Ken, that's why a lot of people uh, who go to income specialists will do so because with an income specialist, they can get closer to 4% instead of one and a quarter. And yes, you might be taking marginally more risk, but I personally believe that it's worth the reward. And be sure to send me your retirement questions by emailing me at askdave at the retirementincomestore.com. Now it's time to bring in Jeff Small. You know, Jeff, uh, it's... Uh, Harry Dent we have back on. It's been just recently, about six weeks ago, we had him on the show. And uh, it'll be fun to see what he has to say. Always a very entertaining guest, huh? 
Harry Dent is definitely one of my favorite guests because he is the contrarian to the bullish mentality in the markets. But more importantly, Dave, I want to focus on something that's near and dear to all of our viewers and listeners, and that is income. And that there are very few income specialists out there, but the ones that are out there like us, from an advisor's perspective, most advisors will push bond mutual funds instead of individual bonds because it's significantly more convenient and they don't have the ability normally to purchase individual bonds for customers. Yeah, it's, it's, and they have the ability in many cases, Jeff. As you know, they're licensed. Some of them may have this, whether it's a Series 7 license or they're fiduciaries as we are and have the same licenses we have. That's true. Um, they can do it legally, but if you don't specialize in bonds, uh, then you're probably not going to do a great job. You know, at the end of the day, in many ways, I guess those growth oriented, those stock market oriented advisors uh, probably are doing their clients a favor by not trying to get out of their comfort zone and get into individual bonds. Um, because if they did, they, they might just screw it all up. Well, that's true. Plus, they have varying degrees and levels of risk and you know, ratings as well. And so that's something also to take into consideration, Dave, that really kind of petrifies an individual uh, financial advisor purchasing bonds. But the bond market is dry. There's nothing to buy anyway. Mm. Well, and, and, and there is, but just as you know, you just have to know where to look. So your average broker, your average do-it-yourself investor doesn't know where to look to get bonds. Um, so as a result, it appears dry because they, they simply don't know. But getting to your point about risk, you know, obviously... Treasury bonds are considered the most secure. Municipal bonds are considered to have a little bit more risk because uh, towns and municipalities and states can go bankrupt, where in theory at least the federal government can't. Uh, and then of course, corporate bonds uh, have even more risk because corporations can go bankrupt. That does happen. Um, and later on the show, I want to spend some time talking about you know, bond ratings and AAA and BBB and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think the most important thing is from an advisor's perspective, you know, they're probably just doing bond funds instead of individual bonds because they're easier. They're just simpler and they probably don't have the bandwidth in their offices to, to do individual bonds and bond-like instruments, even if they have the knowledge, right? That is spot on, Dave. We see that all the time. And so what happens is if you've got maybe a half a dozen different bond funds in your portfolio, each one of those bond managers has a different objective than the other five that are in there. And so you've got these six different objectives in the bond components, but it's much easier for the advisor to just push you into those. Yeah. And you lose the two most important guarantees when he pushes you into the bond fund because you end up owning, as you know, Jeff, essentially the stock of a company that owns bonds. And of course, today's special guest knows a thing or two about stocks, uh, and that's author Harry Dent. But first, I'll be sharing the second shocking fact about bonds, and that's bond bubbles aren't as scary as the media portrays. All that and much more here on The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, founder of the Retirement Income Store. If you're in or near retirement, are you certain you have the right retirement plan in place? Do you want to help ensure your nest egg will last you all throughout retirement? Take our retirement review quiz and find out in five minutes or less if you're doing everything you can to achieve a more successful retirement. Don't waste any more time. Visit myfreeretirementreview.com to find out if you have the right retirement strategy in place. Welcome back to The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and today we're discussing four shocking facts about bonds. And so far, we've covered the important distinction between bonds and bond funds. But now it's time to dive into fact number two, which has to do with so-called bond bubbles. At any given time, when conditions are just right, you'll start reading scary stories in the financial media about this bursting of a bond bubble concept. Yes, it's true that any asset class, including bonds, at times will become overvalued and then ultimately see a correction where the values drop. But I believe the term bursting bubble is misleading and even inaccurate when it comes to bonds. In fact, I think it's often nothing more than a scare tactic that's used by certain media outlets, certain advisors, 
who have a financial interest in steering people away from bonds and toward the stock market. The fact is, the bond market typically reacts much more gradually to negative forces than the stock market. Bonds may suffer modest price pressures over a period of time, but certainly not a sudden crash or an explosive burst. In recent history, the closest thing to a crash occurred in 1994. That's when the Fed mismanaged policy by raising short-term interest rates too quickly. However, even then, the loss in value on investment-grade bonds was slightly less than 3%. In fact, a look back at the entire history of investment-grade bonds shows that the downside in treasuries has always been limited compared to equities. But you know, that's not the only reason I take issue with the concept of this bursting bond bubble, something we'll be talking about more in just a moment. But first, let's get to another one of your questions. This one from Audrey in Wisconsin asks, what does it mean when a bond is rated AAA or triple B? Is one riskier than the other? Audrey, uh, great question. Think of your FICO score, right? If you have a FICO score of 800, and you go to a bank, they're gonna consider that lending you money is a safer bet than somebody who goes who has a FICO score of 600 or even 700. That would be a riskier loan. So the highest FICO score in the bond world, if you will, is AAA. And then as you start going to AA, single A, you get into riskier and riskier debt where somebody buying their bond, uh, essentially the equivalent to the bank making a loan, it's now a riskier endeavor. And as you get into Bs, it becomes riskier. And of course, Cs and Ds are the riskiest. So uh, great question, something that uh, we're about to cover anyway, but you beat me to it. So thanks so much, Audrey. And if you have a question, email me right here at askdave at the retirementincomestore.com. And in a moment, Jeff, we have uh, our guest, uh, Terry Dent, coming on, whom, uh, whom I know uh, you always enjoy. He never, uh, he never, never disappoints, does he? He never disappoints. Um, but getting back to the show, Dave, bonds are significantly different in terms of perception. When the average investor compares them to a stock, they get excited about stocks. They don't get excited about bonds because bonds don't have the same growth potential as stocks. People buy bonds for income, which is significantly different. It's the opposite of stocks. And they have a face value where it's guaranteed to be repaid as long as there's no bankruptcies at maturity. So even if it drops in value, it's Truly, truly a paper loss. But again, I think it's a scare tactic by a lot of people who love the stock market, who are stock market lovers, which uh, brings me, Jeff, to the introduction of our special guest, Harry Dent, author of Zero Hour and editor of the Economy and Markets newsletter, available for free at harrydent.com. Harry, as usual, great to have you here with us on The Income Generation. Yeah, nice to be back. Harry, we've had some volatility recently. I can feel the breeze of volatility starting to affect the markets. And so we, we're looking for a correction at some point here shortly between now and the end of September, maybe October. Is it going to be COVID that causes the, the correction or is it going to be the Fed's expansionary policies? You know, I, I think it's really just that, that we've stretched this market so far with so much stimulus. And of course, COVID gave governments around the world, and especially in the U.S., the, the, the excuse to really step up, not just with massively stronger monetary stimulus after 12 or 13 years of that, but also very substantial uh, fiscal and infrastructure stimulus, which is still being uh, debated and, and, and to be fully passed in Congress. But we're talking about upwards of 60, 65 percent of GDP um, in stimulus, monetary and fiscal just since late 2019 and the repo crisis right before COVID and since COVID. So, so COVID is the whole reason for this overreaction and stimulus. But I've been warning the fundamentals because, you know, my, my demographics measure where the consumers really at in their natural spending cycles. And we're at the lowest points between 2020 and 23 we're going to see. So, so the markets are in a huge disconnect. Uh, with the economy. It's all because of stimulus. And, you know, you just keep stretching this thing until it starts to pop and something goes wrong and then people lose confidence. Now, COVID is starting to come back. Uh, this new variant is is a little more contagious and, and, and potentially lethal and stuff. So I, and so you're seeing some lockdowns like 
you know, even Australia, where I do a lot of presentations, they've had nothing burger for this, but they're still very cautious. So I think that may be part of it. But I think this this rally's just wearing out. You can how many times can people refinance their home or, or trade up to a little nicer house or buy a vacation house, even though they don't need one? I just sold one, by the way, and very happy because I realized I didn't really need that second house. Well, those are all great points, Harry, but why has the bond market been acting so weird and why is it mystifying everybody with a recent decline in the 10 year? Yeah, yeah, this one, okay. The stock market's been doing this forever and all the stimulus and, and ultra low interest rates, but I think the bond market, I was reading an article that said that a lot of these, you know, uh, funds and stuff that are investing in equities and stuff have to have some uh, kind of reserves and something or collateral and they tend to put it in treasury bonds. So. The more the stock market goes up, it, it means there's there's certain areas where where invest uh, you know professional and institutional investors have to hedge that with, with treasury bonds, and they're they're buying them for no good reason. And 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 you're right, they, there's nothing more out of whack right now than the ten year treasury, uh, you know, that's saying like inflation looks like it's zero for the coming years when inflation is sitting and continues to rise at 5% and more. And hey, yeah. nobody thinks it's going to be 5% two, yeah. three, four years from now. But even Janet Yellen had to come out and say, look, this is not going to stop anytime soon. Right. And, right. and my view is there's only one thing that's going to stop this short-term inflation, and that's a recession. And the recession right. is not good for corporate bonds, so, and it's terrible so, for stocks. So, Harry, you know, it, it, could it be a traditional – flight to quality that's happening right now. I mean, after all, and I'm going to make a caveat here so everybody knows that we're recording this show two weeks before it actually airs. But I know that you had said 4,400, 4,500 would be the peak on the S&P. It, it got to about 4,393, almost 4,400. And it, it seemed that the 10-year the yield went down. So could it just be a flight to quality that, that, that maybe the, the market is, is no longer trying to make all three of us look silly? <laughs> You know, I don't think it's that. Now, this I'm, I'm talking about a channel there, and as time goes on, as long as the market key and hasn't broken that channel, it'll have to break about 4,200 on the S&P 500, which we got close to but did not break. That channel keeps going up, so that's target more like 4,600 now, and and it'll just keep going up until the market breaks that upward momentum, which it hasn't done yet. So I no, I don't think it's a flight to quality. I think investors. Just, I mean, this has been going on forever. Everybody knows somehow in the back of your mind, you don't get something for nothing. And how can you live on an economy where government just constantly print money, which is, you know, out of nowhere and, and think that can cause long-term growth, which it can't, but it is a short-term stimulus. And, and so I, I don't think people are going flight to quality. I think people have learned you buy the stock market on dips and until something's proven otherwise, hey, COVID was an exception. And you know, COVID, yes, caused the steepest crash, fastest we've seen in two months in a while, but it came right back because governments use it as an excuse to stimulate harder than ever. So I, I don't think people are running to quality. I do think that, like this article says, a lot of, of leveraged uh, vehicles for investing in stocks need a certain amount of collateral. And I think these treasury bonds are being bought for that reason. Cause, cause again, they have nothing to do with the inflation outlook. Sure, uh, inflation sure. is not subsiding, as I said, and it is more at 5%. Yeah, and yeah. these treasury bonds are at 1.3% or less acting yeah, like yeah. inflation would be zero. Cause you have to earn a little return over inflation. Oh, you're, and you're right. There seems inflation to be zero. There seems to be a disconnect. Yeah, the only time there isn't a disconnect is if the inflation turns out to be extremely, extremely transitory. Uh, otherwise, anything longer term, you're at huge disconnect between that and the bond market. Harry Dent, thanks again for being here with us on the Income Generation. Sure. Coming up after the break, we'll talk about the third shocking fact that you need to know about bonds. Their values aren't strictly determined by interest rates. Not that simple. Plus, we'll talk to income specialist Michael Stewart, located just outside of Chicago. All this and more coming up on the Income Generation. For behind-the-scenes photos, retirement planning tips, and upcoming giveaways, follow the Income Generation show on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch video clips, guest interviews, and to catch up on past episodes. Welcome back to the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. 
And thanks for tuning in as we reveal four shocking facts about bonds. So far, we've looked at why bond funds aren't bonds and why bond bubbles aren't as scary as the media portrays. But now let's talk about why interest rates aren't the only thing that affect bond values. It's commonly known that bonds and interest rates have an inverse relationship. So when rates go up, bond values go down and vice versa. However, there are many other factors besides interest rates that affect bond values, including one that I talk about frequently, and that's credit spreads. Credit spreads are determined by the amount of extra interest that an investor might require to go from a risk-free U.S. Treasury bond to a corporate bond of a certain grade. Now, keep in mind, when interest rates rise, it's usually because consumers and investors are growing more confident. When that happens, investors generally require less additional interest to make that switch from government bonds to a corporate bond. And that's how this thing called credit spread compression works. And when it does occur, it creates a natural softening effect for bond portfolios when interest rates are going up. We saw a great example of that earlier this year when the yield on the 10-year Treasury rate rose by over 8 tenths of a percent. That was quite a spike. But did all bond investors see their portfolios drop as a result? Absolutely not. Why? Because the interest rate on certain double and triple B corporate bonds in their portfolios rose by much less than that of treasuries, thereby softening the impact of rising rates overall. In fact, the portfolios of many income investors are actually up on the year, thanks largely to the effects of credit spread compression. Now let's take a minute and let's go to another one of your questions. Brad from Iowa asks, I keep reading how great the economy is doing now. Does that mean that interest rates have to rise again pretty soon? Brad, great crush question. And the textbook says yes. But as you've seen lately, if you're watching, the interest rate on the 10-year government bond was up around 1.7. It went from 0.9 to 1.7 earlier this year, and it came back down to about one and a quarter. So although we have all this talk about inflation, economic recovery, there's still a lot of downward pressure on interest rates. And Brad, you just heard Harry Dent talk about why he thinks, not so much because there's a flight to quality, although I'm not sure I agree. I think there could still be a little flight to quality, a little nervousness about the market at these levels that's buying uh, high quality bonds. But as he said also, there's a lot of institutional buyers, insurance companies and the like that have to buy those. And at the end of the day, that ends up you know, pushing those prices up and pushing the yields down. And be sure to send me your questions by emailing me at askdave at the retirementincomestore.com. And now, Jeff, we talk about this a lot, but, you know, I'm sure you'll agree that for people who are retired or approaching retirement, there's not much that's more important than really understanding bonds and bond-like instruments, at least to some level, right? Well, it's almost a necessity, Dave, especially if they're going to be utilizing their savings to create income. They're going to need to own some of those bond and bond-like instruments to do that. And so just like the financial markets aren't simple, the bond market isn't simple either. It's, as a matter of fact, becoming more complex um, with the monetary policies of the Fed and backing up the bond market has sent weird signals in the rate markets. And now we have bonds that really weren't investment grade selling at higher prices than they should because of the demand is being so high for yield. There's no place to get yield today, Dave. So everybody's scrambling. Yeah. And I think people are feeling more confident, too, uh, because they know that, OK, even if interest rates do go up, you know, that that that's not the only factor. You know, interest rates came up in the first quarter, but uh, bond portfolios that weren't focused all on treasuries didn't do badly in the first quarter, even when rates came up. Um, and I think there's also a sense of confidence that, you know, the Fed jumped in and bought bond ETFs when, you know, things were falling apart last year. And that, well, if bond prices drop too far, Fed's just going to jump in and do that again. So I'm not sure I agree with that, but I think people are thinking that. Well, I think the bond, the credit markets and the bond markets are thinking that, Dave. The individual investors really don't quite fathom how that's possible, but that's the policies that we have in place. The Fed went all in, not just with a blank check mentality, but with a complete concrete wall to support the credit markets and the bond markets where no bond holder was going to be left holding a bag and lose their money if, if somebody became insolvent, whether it was a municipality 
or a sure. company. But even without that, though, even if we don't count on that, that doesn't happen again, I want our viewers and our listeners to know that at the end of the day, that credit spread compression is what helped people uh, in the first quarter when rates had skyrocketed, maybe where they lost very little, if maybe none at all. And then in the second quarter, when things rebounded, how a lot of fixed income accounts came back even quicker. And Jeff, our next guest, of course, knows a thing or two about bonds and credit spread compression, and that's Michael Stewart, founder of Crystal Lake Tax and Financial, a retirement income store located just outside of Chicago. He's also Amazon best-selling co-author of the book, Purpose-Based Investing. Mike, as usual, it's our pleasure to have you back here on The Income Generation. Happy to be here, guys. Michael Stewart. What would you say is the number one misconception people have about investing in individual bonds? Yeah, the biggest misconception, I think, is that individuals think they're more risky than individual bond funds. And as you like to talk before, one of the concerns with that or why that's a misconception is that the only guarantee you really have when you're in a bond fund is whatever the price is. You don't have control over the yield. You don't have control over the maturity. There's a lot of the things that benefit individual securities, individual bonds that you actually give up going into a bond fund. So really, it's an education procedure to really let people know the benefits of investing in individual bonds. So why do you think advisors, financial advisors, recommend individual bond funds versus, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that, recommend bond funds instead of individual bonds themselves? Uh, as has been shared by, you know, one of our uh, mutual friends, you know, Greg in Tulsa, uh, I call it the disease of ease, right? He shares that with you. It's just so much easier for, you know, typical Wall Street firms, individual investor, you know, individual brokers, essentially, that just don't have the resources available to do a lot of the research or really don't even want to take the time. If, so if a client needs to get, you know, pull a little bit of a risk off the table, get out of the market, go into more bond and bond-like instruments, it's just check a box. That's really that simple for uh, the broker to do. But what you do is, once again, you give up all the benefits or most of the benefits of investing in individual bonds. I like to think it's laziness, but at the, at the end of the day, I just don't think it's doing a service to the client. So what would you say to bond investors right now who may be worried about interest rates rising again this year? Yeah, I think there's, there's two sides of that. So if you are an individual bond funds, I think you legitimately should be concerned. And the reason why is that whole teeter-totter of is interest rates eventually, whether it's six months from now or two years from now, begin to go up. Of course, if all you own is a bond fund, you have no assurances for return of principal or what your yield's going to be. Now, if you're invested in good credit quality individual bonds, that changes the dynamic because, once again, you know what your yield is going to be you know what the maturity is going to be on that individual bonds. And if you extrapolate out a couple of years and you expect as interest rates will go up over the next few years, now you'll have those bonds not only paying you yield leading up to that, but, you're, but assuming they're still in business, you're going to get all your principal back, the face value, when they mature and hopefully be able to reinvest at a higher rate. So for bond fund investors, I would be concerned. For owners of individual bonds, uh, I think it's all noise. And Michael, you know, do you mind sharing with our viewers and our listeners uh, a little something about why maybe you want to sprinkle things into an income portfolio other than just bonds and preferreds to, to help offset this in case interest rates do spike? Yeah, another misconception is that the only way you can get yield or even get income really is, you know, I've got to go more safe. I've got to go specifically on to individual bonds, preferreds, things that you talk about every week, Dave, on the show. The reality is that you can get income and still get growth, you know, through good blue chip dividend paying stocks, things that still have a growth component, but also pay a pretty sustainable regular dividend in at the same time. So you get income, but just as importantly, if you think about if inflation starts creeping up or even as, inf as interest rates begin to rise, uh, you want something that's going to keep up with that. So keeping up with inflation is going to be, you know, good dividend paying stocks. So it's not always about just going into fixed income. It's about having opportunity for income and growth on the same asset. Sure. Or even other bond like instruments like I often refer to when I talk about business development companies, BDCs or real estate investment trusts, REITs. So, Michael, uh, uh, once again, uh, it's been great having you. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. And coming up, we'll talk about one more shocking fact that you should know. Investing in bonds doesn't necessarily mean sacrificing growth. 
Plus, we'll talk to our next guest, income specialist Eric Lardner from Dallas. All that and much more coming up right here on The Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. During my career, I found that most baby boomers have done a great job growing their retirement savings, yet many don't know how to convert their savings into steady income. And that is why I built the Retirement Income Store, to help hardworking Americans preserve their assets and establish steady streams of income. If you're 55 or older, our free Retirement Income Kit is for you. It's chock full of information you need to know to get steady income during your retirement. Call 866-710-1749, online at theretirementincomestore.com. Welcome back to the Income Generation. It's great to have you here. I'm David Scranton, and today we're discussing four shocking facts about bonds. And so far we've covered bonds versus bond funds, bond bubbles, and also this somewhat complex concept of credit spread compression. But now let's focus on the fourth shocking fact, and that is why investing in bonds doesn't necessarily mean giving up portfolio growth. From the moment you start earning income, you're told it's a good idea to have your money working for you. When you're a kid, that typically means putting it in the bank and earning interest. When you grow up, you move on to other strategies, and usually that means investing in the stock market, where your money can work even harder and hopefully grow more. Of course, you also know the stock market is riskier than the bank, but you know you're willing to take that risk because you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s uh, in, in, in an effort to make sure you save enough for retirement, you want that growth. But there's a misconception, and that is when you invest in bonds and bond-like instruments instead of the stock market, you might as well have gone back to the bank. And that couldn't be further from the truth, especially today. Most bank accounts now earn you less than 1% interest. But an actively managed portfolio of individual bonds and bond-like instruments can both generate returns at competitive rates, but also allow you to grow your portfolio organically. And that means by reinvesting the income you don't need into other income-based strategies, uh, strategies that might also include stock market options geared toward dividends. In other words, bond investors aren't necessarily sacrificing growth, they're simply creating it more strategically. And now it's time to get to one last question from you. Mary Jo from Ohio asks, does investing in a 20-year bond really make sense if you're in your late 70s and probably maybe won't live 20 years? Well, it depends on your personal situation with your estate, your heirs, you know, a 20-year bond just increases the risk that if you don't make it 20 years, that if you, if, if you pass on before that time, that it'll be down in value, especially, you know, should interest rates rise or credit spread compression not help out, et cetera, et cetera, for a whole bunch of reasons. But if that happens, Mary Jo, um, then if your kids, your heirs want to hold it to maturity, then it doesn't matter. So if you have three children, and let's say, for example, it's hard to get them to agree on any one thing at any given time, then chances are they're not going to agree to hold it, and the executor of the state's going to have to sell the bond early, in which case it may not make a lot of sense. But if you have one child who's going to get it all and might hold it, then I wouldn't worry too much about your time frame, because your time frame and holding period essentially transfer to your heirs. Okay. Great question, and thank you. And once again, be sure to send me your retirement questions by emailing me at askdave at theretirementincomestore.com. Jeff, our final segment here. I know we're, we're taking a little break, and we've recorded some shows. We're taking a little break. So uh, I don't want to get sentimental, but uh, you know, I'm going to kind of, kind of sort of miss you over the next couple of weeks. We're not recording a show. I don't know what to say to that, Dave, except you're making me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a sentimental mood. Okay, fine. Then let's talk about <clears throat> average returns in the market and why they're fiction, okay? There you go. Let's get to business. All right. So you bring up a great point. The stock market's average return is something a retired investor should never pay attention to, especially if they're going to create income from their portfolio. Their average return has no applicability whatsoever. 100%, Jeff. You know, um, if you're not contributing or making distributions from your holdings, then average is what you focus on. If you're younger and you're contributing, 
then your effective return will most likely be higher than the average, which is good. But when you're pulling money out because you're retired, your effective return will essentially oftentimes be lower than the average. So you're right, definitely don't want to look at averages when you're taking withdrawals or distributions. Yeah, it, it makes no sense to do that. And so if a retiree plans on pulling out 4% a year from their savings to live on or to augment their income in retirement, then all they really need is to look for investments like bonds and bond-like instruments that will generate 4% interest to cover their withdrawal and not have a forced reduction or of their principal by way of liquidating assets via a growth strategy. That's why averages don't work. Yeah, and, and you know what? It, it, bottom line is people can still get good yield in the stock market if they want to play the game and try to get some more growth. But why do it? If you can have a contract that's paying you that 4%, and that's enough for you to, to, to live the retirement you want, then you know why, why not do that, right? Well, there's, there's no doubt about that. But even more importantly, David, these new all-time market peaks, these market conditions, could you imagine designing an income strategy for a 65-year-old new retiree based on the stock market? That's right. That's crazy. That's right, because bonds are a lot less volatile than stocks. Yeah, they'll fluctuate in value, but, but it's a much more secure strategy. And you could really not have to worry about looking at the newspaper anymore, not worrying about what the Dow Jones Industrial Average does makes retirement a lot more enjoyable for most folks. And Jeff, now it's time to introduce our next guest who knows a thing or two also about bonds and bond-like instruments, and that's Eric Lardner, founder of Abundant Wealth Management, a retirement income store located in Dallas, Texas. Eric, as usual, great to have you with us. Thanks, Dave, great to see you guys. Eric, right out of the gate, I'm gonna ask you a question. Are most people aware that there's differences between bonds and bond funds? Do the average investor understand the differences? Definitely not. Um, you know, the difference between owning a bond directly and a bond mutual fund. Uh, with, with mutual funds, you don't own anything other than stock in a company that owns either bonds or depending on the type of fund, individual equities. So you have the risk of uh, loss of capital if there's redemptions. Whereas if you own a bond directly, you have a contract for a specified um, interest rate for a specified period of time. And uh, as long as you hold those bonds to maturity, you get all your money back. So it's a so, contractual investment. So big advantage over oh, big advantage owning individual bonds over bond ETFs or bond mutual funds. But why should a retired investor have a large segment or some segment of their savings invested in individual bonds? What, what would they want to accomplish with that kind of, a, of an objective, let's say? Well, they're, they're more stable. Uh, they provide steadier returns. And, uh, you know, with the contract, uh, as long as you maintain, uh, as long as you hold the bond to maturity, you'll get all your money back. Uh, so that's the primary benefit of it is the consistent returns and the, uh, the safety of getting all your money back. So I think the, the biggest misconception, though, is people and investors don't understand that they're investing by contract. And so they have a contractual agreement to do what, Eric? To receive a, a specified rate of interest from the corporation that issues the bond and a guarantee that they'll get their money back or a contractual guarantee that they'll get their money back when the, uh, when the bond uh, matures. Right. And Eric, isn't it true that you know, you talk to people every day in the Dallas area, and, and I know everybody says, don't mess with Texas, right? Texans are supposed to be tough. But I bet a lot of the people you talk to on a daily basis really, you know, they, they like those, they like having those guarantees. They, a lot of them, I bet, like that contractual aspect, right? Very much so. In fact, that's what gives most people a, a level of comfort that uh, they otherwise wouldn't have once they understand that concept that they, they do have a contract and... Um, you know, the corporation that issues the bond owes them a specified interest rate and all their money back when the bond matures. So how often do you hear people say, you know, we've talked about a lot in the show, as you heard, but I mean, how often do you hear people say, well, I don't know if I want to buy bonds now, interest rates are going up. Do you hear that a lot? Or do you think, you know, people realize there are other factors that affect bond prices, not just interest rates? Well, we do have, you know, some credit spread compression that uh, softens the blow a little bit when rates yep. increase. 
Um, however, again, going back to the contractual aspect of owning a, a, a bond, as long as you're holding the bond to maturity, uh, you're going to get that contractual rate of interest, and you're also going to get all your money back when the bond matures. And at that point, if rates have risen, uh, you purchase new bonds, you're going to get a higher rate. Yeah. Yep, that's right. So, uh, so in other words, they shouldn't be that concerned about it is really the bottom line. So, Eric Lardner, thanks so much for joining us today. It's, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for joining me once again here on The Income Generation. Thanks to Jeff Small and all of our guests. We've had a great time. Here's the bottom line. If you're close to or you're in retirement and you're concerned about your money, it's essential you stay informed and up to date. And as you know, right here is where you can do it on the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton, and we'll be back with you next week.